Welcome back. Thank you. Um, so it's a little bit different than our normal process, so we don't have a chairman up here, so I'm just going to go ahead and introduce Kelly Dennett to my left and Dave Van Voorhees, um, both from NOAA Fisheries. And Kelly and Dave are going to walk us through the transition to the new MRIP catch estimates, both from the change from the coastal household telephone survey to the new mail survey, as well as the calibration change from the changes to the APIS um, program from, I believe it's 2013. Um, so with further ado, Kelly and Dave. Thanks, Tony. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Pleasure to be back here talking about this wonderful four-letter word with all of you. Um, my name is Kelly Dennett. I am the Chief of the Domestic Fisheries Division in our Office of Sustainable Fisheries here in Silver Spring and co-chair of the Fishing Effort Survey Transition Team with Dave. I'm Dave Van Voorhees, Chief of the Fisheries Statistics Division in the Office of Science and Technology in NOAA Fisheries Headquarters and uh, co-chair the transition team for MRIP with Kelly. All right, so um, go ahead to the next slide, please. So going to take a couple minutes to go through a few slides that we've touched on in previous presentations, just as a reminder to get us all on the same baseline. Um, and then Dave is gonna go through a few species specific slides so everyone can see the difference between the calibrated data and the historical data. Um, and then I'll wrap it up with a few additional slides that kind of touch on next steps and, and what's coming down the pike. So just to get us started, as a reminder, uh, we use two different surveys to get an estimate of total catch. Uh, the first is effort. That's the one that was the CHTS, the Coastal Household Telephone Survey, that has since been replaced with the Fishing Effort Survey, the FES. Uh, and we use that survey to get our estimate of the number of angler trips. Catch rate is estimated using APIS, the Access Point Angler Intercept Survey, uh, and that's what gives us uh, the estimated number of fish caught per angler trip. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so just as a reminder, the fishing effort survey is replacing the legacy CHTS. Uh, we were seeing a, a number of issues uh, in terms of response rate with the telephone survey, and so we've transitioned to this new based, new mail-based survey. The focus is shore and private boat mode. This is not covering uh, the for hire fleet, um, just as a, as a general reminder. It's also using the USPS database and angler registry as its sampling frame. And overall, we're getting higher and more accurate estimates uh, of trips. And just, again, that kind of 30,000 foot level, uh, it was about five times higher in the shore mode in terms of effort and approximately three times higher uh, in terms of the private boat uh, mode. Uh, and that does vary by mode and wave and, and state. Um, we also have uh, changes from the Access Point Angler Intercept Survey from APIS, um, and as Tony mentioned, that new design was implemented a few years ago, uh, but this calibration, the data we're going to show you today is incorporating both those changes as well as the fishing effort survey changes. Next slide. So just a few points to hit on as to why did we move to this fishing effort survey, uh, this mail-based approach. Um, so the first is we're reaching more anglers. CHTS was landline-based. As we've moved through time, fewer and fewer, and fewer folks even have landlines. Um, even those that do are using caller ID, not answering phone calls from numbers they don't recognize. I'm sure you all get a number of calls, even on your cell phones, um, where you don't recognize the number and you just hit that red button to, to decline that call. Um, we're also getting the survey into the right hands with the telephone survey. Whoever answered the phone uh, was the one taking the survey. Uh, with the mail-based approach, uh, we're seeing the survey getting into the hand of actual anglers um, in the household. As a result, we're seeing three times a uh, higher response rate. And uh, I'm not going to touch too much on the improved questionnaire, um, but we have improved it to incorporate questions not just about fishing but weather and other things. Um, and in addition, the mail-based approach is allowing us to get more complete answers. Uh, so rather than having those awkward silences on the phone when you're getting asked a question, folks can actually take their time, answer the survey, consult their calendars or their phone, whatever they need to, um, to think about uh, what they've done. Next slide, please. 
As a general reminder, the National Academies have reviewed both of these uh, method changes to the FES and the APIS um, and endorsed both. Uh, the fishing effort survey was considered a major um, improvement, um, and the APIS, uh, they highlighted the fact that it's using state-of-the-art uh, methods. Next slide, please. So just to touch on the transition plan, um, which I know many of you are familiar with, so I won't spend a ton of time on it, uh, but this was obviously a collaborative effort between NOAA Fisheries, the councils, the states, and the commission. Uh, we knew that we couldn't make this change instantaneously. It was gonna take time, and we needed to do a stepwise approach. So working together, we did a three-year benchmarking period from 2015 to 2017, which allowed us to compare the mail based survey to the phone survey. This also allowed us to do the calibration um, that Dave is going to take us through um, so that we could um, calibrate that historical data into the new currency that we have using the fishing effort survey. The result of all of that is um, new data that can go into our stock assessments to inform our management decisions. Next slide. So one of the questions that Dave and I have been getting the most um, as we've been talking about this new data relates to the 2018 annual catch limits. So all of those catch limits were set using the CHTS estimates. So the calibration model will allow us to back calibrate um, the data that we're getting this year under the FES into that CHTS currency. So that we're making sure to compare catch to ACLs in the same currency by which they were developed. Um, so that's one that we've gotten um, a number of questions about and tried to be very clear um, in our webinars with folks to understand um, how that comparison uh, is going to work. And so with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Dave. This slide shows how applying the calibrations has changed historical estimates of private boat anger fishing trips for the Atlantic coast. The orange line represents the uncalibrated estimates and the blue line represents the calibrated estimates. The peer-reviewed calibration model that was developed to account for the difference between the fishing effort survey and coastal household telephone survey estimates of fishing effort showed two significant factors driving the difference. If you can click the next, yeah. The first factor I'm gonna to refer to as the telephone versus mail factor. We find that households respond differently to telephone and mail surveys. So the two contact methods have different effects on the way household residents respond. This effect is, is apparent in explaining the difference you see in those early years. Go to the next one. We also see that there's a wireless effect. This is due to the increasing use of wireless telephones, which has significantly decreased the coverage of the legacy telephone survey. As Kelly pointed out, it's a random digit dialing telephone survey that only reaches landlines in people's households. <clears throat> the new mail survey actually reaches households with landline phones, cell phones only, or both, as well as households that don't have any phones. As the coverage of the coastal household telephone survey decreased, the survey was reaching a much smaller proportion of residential households, and the fishing effort survey is showing us now that households with landline phones are now taking fewer fishing trips on average than the households without landline phones. Therefore, the difference between the telephone and mail survey <coughs> The difference between the telephone and mail survey estimates of fishing effort has been growing beyond the difference expected due to just the difference in how people respond to phone and mail contacts. So in the more recent years, we're showing here on the graph that you have the telephone versus mail effect, but in addition to that, there's the wireless effect on top of it. The changes in private boat effort vary in magnitude among subregions and among states within each subregion. But overall, we see the same pattern throughout the time series. 
the overall ratio in this case for the Atlantic coast is about is 2.03. So it's about a doubling overall of the effort estimates over the whole time series. But the proportional change is relatively constant from 1981 to 1999 due to what we're calling the telephone versus mail factor. The ratio during that time frame is on average 1.78, which is close to a doubling of anger trips, but not quite. In the years following, from 2001 to 2014, that ratio increases to 2.15, which is more than a doubling. And in the more recent years, um, due to the wireless effect, we see that the ratio actually increases to as high as 2.85, which is about 70% greater than in 81 to, to 2000. <clears throat> this pattern is what we expected to see as a result of applying the peer-reviewed calibration model for the switch from the phone survey to the mail survey. Next slide. This slide shows how applying the calibrations has changed historical estimates of shore anger fishing trips for the Atlantic coast. Here again, the orange line represents uncalibrated estimates and the blue line represents calibrated estimates. And that will be consistent through the remainder of the slides I'll be showing you. <clears throat> Note that the changes in shore fishing effort are proportionally much greater than the changes in private boat fishing effort throughout the time series. This is what we expected to see based on the side-by-side -side comparisons for 2015 through 2017. The changes in shore fishing effort here again vary in magnitude among subregions and among states within each subregion, but overall we see a very similar pattern throughout the time series. Overall the ratio is 4.55, which is uh, more than a quadrupling of the effort estimates throughout the time series. But if you look at it in the different parts of the time series, you can see that the proportional change is relatively more constant from 1981 to 1999, an average ratio of 4.34, uh, which is more than a quadrupling of the number of anger trips. In the more recent years, from 2000 to 2014, that ratio increases to 4.57, and in the most recent years during the benchmarking period, uh, reaches a level of 5.75, which is as much as, you know, more than five times greater than the originally uncalibrated estimate. This pattern is consistent with what we saw in the side-by-side -side comparisons during the benchmarking period. The next slide is basically showing you how the change ratios that I've just reviewed for the whole Atlantic coast vary among different uh, parts of the different subregions along the coast. This just gives you an idea that the, basically we're seeing greater changes for private boat effort in the South Atlantic subregion than what we're seeing in the New, in the New England subregion. Uh, Mid-Atlantic's pretty similar to what we see for the South Atlantic. The next slide shows the same change ratios by subregion for shore fishing effort. Here again, you can see that the, the changes do vary somewhat by subregion, with the greatest changes occurring in the South Atlantic, uh, the, the smallest changes occurring in the New England subregion. Next slide. We are now going to step through some changes in catch estimates for some example stocks. We're going to start with bluefish because it showed some of the largest changes given the high proportion of catch from shore for this species. And shore is where we see the biggest change in the effort estimates. We will then step through some other examples, generally going from those priority stocks where we see the largest changes to those that have smaller changes. You will be able to run queries on our website to generate very similar graphs to what I'm showing you here today. Just want to make sure you know that. There's, it's a setup on our website where you go to do queries for catch estimates where you can actually select 
uh, change comparisons or calibration comparisons, I'm sorry, where you can see the before and after uh, for a particular state or subregion for a particular uh, stock that you're interested in looking at. So this slide shows you the changes to bluefish harvest based on both the intercept survey and uh, fishing effort survey calibrations. You'll be able to do this kind of query, as I just said, uh, on the website. It shows how the historical estimates have changed for the Atlantic coast. The changes in estimates for this species are greater in magnitude overall than for most fish species. And this is because close to 65% of bluefish catch is from shore. And the greatest changes in effort and catch estimates are seen in the shore mode. Note that the proportional changes are relatively constant for 1981 to 2000. Uh, with a change ratio of 2.35. It's about 135% increase, which is more than a doubling of the uncalibrated harvest estimate. That ratio increases as you move forward from 2000 to the present to as high as 3.73 ratio in the most recent three years, 2015 to 2017. That's about a 270% increase, which is almost a quadrupling of the, um, of the uncalibrated estimate of harvest for bluefish. Next slide. This slide shows how the calibrations changed to historical estimates of total catch for bluefish. And by total catch, I'm referring to the harvest plus the catch that's released alive. The pattern is pretty similar. Uh, as you can see, the, in the early years, from 81 to 2000, the ratio, ratio is about 2.41, which is about 140% increase. But as you move from 2000 to the present, that, in, that difference gradually increases to more than 300% increase above the uncalibrated total catch estimate. The next slide. This is showing how the calibrations changed historical estimates of red drum harvest on the Atlantic coast. Um, note that the changes for this species are not as great as they were for bluefish. Uh, about, only about 28% of the catch of this species is from shore historically. Note that the proportional changes, though, are showing a similar pattern. Uh, in the early years, from 81, to 1999, the change ratio is about 2.5. It's about 150% increase over the uncalibrated estimate. And in the more recent years, that, that difference increases as you move forward to 2017, reaching a ratio of 4.05, which is basically a 300% increase or a quadrupling uh, by the end of the time series. <clears throat> Next slide. Here again, this is red drum, but it's showing total catch rather than just harvest. The pattern's very similar. In the years 81 to 2000, we have about 150% increase in the total catch estimate on average. And then as you go to more re through from 2001 to 2017, the difference increases to about a 300% increase. <clears throat> the next slide. We'll look here at striped bass harvest for the Atlantic coast. Striped bass, pretty similar to red drum in terms of the catch from shore, about, about the same percentage. And we're seeing a, a similar amount of difference, but not quite as great uh, as what we saw for red drum. Overall, the change of throughout the time series is about a doubling. In the early years, from 81 to 2000, uh, we're seeing a 130% increase, which is more than a doubling. But in the more recent years, that difference increases gradually to a point where by the end of the time series, uh, we have about 150% increase, which is well more than a doubling.
This just shows striped bass total catch estimates and how they've changed with the calibrations. Uh, very similar pattern to what we see for harvest. Uh, the changes from 81 to 2000, the change ratio is 2.4. It's about 140% increase. Um, and in the more recent years, that change ratio increases to about three by the end of the time series, which is about a 200% increase or, or a tripling of the uncalibrated estimate. The next slide is for black sea bass. And I want to point out here, uh, we're only showing black sea bass harvest estimates for Virginia through uh, Virginia North. Uh, and that's because at this point in time, when we made these slides, we didn't have the capability of splitting out the northern stock from the southern stock for the state of North Carolina, which we now will be able to do because <laughs> we just uh, posted on our website our um, public use data sets for the whole time series, 81 to 2017, that will that people can use to run CAM programs that will produce estimates that will split out estimates within a state like North Carolina, north of Hatteras, south of Hatteras, so you can actually look at the separate stocks for black sea bass. Similarly, that will be allowed for Atlantic cod and other stocks where it's necessary to split uh, using boundaries that are not state boundaries for the stocks. So in this graph, we're just looking at uh, black sea bass Virginia North, and you can see that uh, the changes are not as great as what we saw for prior species. Uh, less catch of black sea bass from shore, historically on the order of no more than 20 percent. Um, for the earlier years, 81 to 2000, we're seeing only about a 16 percent increase from the uncalibrated to the calibrated estimates. That difference does increase as we move from 2000 forward to the present, uh, reaching about 140 percent increase or more than a slightly more than a doubling uh, by the end of the time series. <clears throat> the next graph shows the pattern for black sea bass total catch. Uh, it's quite similar. Uh, we're seeing about an 80 percent increase, a little bit greater in total catch for the, um, I'm sorry, 40 percent increase for the earlier years. And, and then in the more recent years, that increase is, uh, gets larger to as much as 160 percent uh, by the end of the time series, which is more than a doubling. <clears throat> the next slide is for Tautog. Uh, for, for harvest and the change that we're seeing with the applying the calibrations. Uh, for this species, we're seeing in the early years from 81 to 2000, a change ratio of almost two, so it's about a 200% increase. Um, I'm sorry, about a 100% increase, <laughs> which is about a doubling on the average. Um, in the more recent years, that uh, ratio increases to a point where it's about 3.5 by the end of the time series. Uh, that's basically um, more than a tripling overall of the uncalibrated estimate. The next slide shows Tautog total catch estimates before and after. A uh, very similar pattern to what we saw on the previous slide. Um, basically, uh, change ratio of about two for the early years, 81 to 2000. And from 2000 forward, that increases to about, uh, to, to more than three by the end of the time series, which is um, more than a 250% increase over the uncalibrated estimates. <clears throat> The next species, next slide, is weak fish. The harvest estimates for that species, how they change with the calibrations. Um, similar pattern here to what we saw for the previous 
couple of species in, in early years, 81 to 2000. The change ratio is about 1.6, that's about 160 percent, um, and it's about a 60 percent increase in the, in the estimate, basically, from the uncalibrated to the calibrated. And then in the more recent years, that change increases uh, to about a 220 percent increase by the end of the time series, which is uh, more than a tripling of the original estimate. Weak fish total catch, uh, here again, very similar to what we saw for weak fish harvest. Uh, early years, change ratio uh, showing about a 70 percent increase over the original estimate, and then in the more, in the more recent years, that gradually increases to a difference where there's about a, a little bit more than a 200 percent increase, which is slightly more than a tripling of the original estimate. Next slide. The last species I'm going to show you graphs for is Atlantic cod. And for this species, I'm going to show you how the calibration for the intercept survey design change actually had some impact uh, relative to the calibration for the change from the phone survey to the, to the mail survey. And this is actually true, and you'll find this true for a number of different species, but this is one species where the intercept survey calibration had a consistent effect in the same direction. So I wanted to point this out as, a, as an example. Uh, this first slide just shows you how the, both, the results of both calibrations changed the Atlantic cod harvest estimates for the Atlantic coast. You can see that the relative amount of change is pretty small compared to other species. There's, there's basically no shore catch, almost no shore catch of Atlantic cod, so uh, we don't expect the changes to be as great for this stock, uh, for, the, for the Atlantic cod stocks, I should say. Um, <clears throat> in the early years from 81 to 2000, it looks like there's a pretty small change. It's only about a 16 percent increase uh, over the uncalibrated estimates. In the more recent years, from 2000 forward to 2017, it actually goes up to about a 200 percent increase by the end of the time series. So um, there's that that indication that there was very little change in the early years from 81 to 2000 could be misleading unless we look at the next graph, which actually shows, um, oh, colors look a little bit different on the screen than what I'm seeing. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, we got, we've got a blue line, which is basically the result of both calibrations. The purple line on the graph, which is a new line that I'm showing you, is just the, the result after applying the intercept survey calibration, but not applying the calibration for the switch from the phone survey to the mail survey. And what you can see here is that the intercept survey calibration actually had a consistent effect for Atlantic Cod of decreasing the catch estimates in those early years. Uh, and that counteracted the effect of the calibration for the switch from the phone survey to the mail survey. So in this case, the change, the overall change for the early years looked small, be partly because the uh, intercept survey calibration was, was bringing the estimates down at the same time that the other calibration was bringing the estimates up. <clears throat> I just wanted you to see that as an example of where the, the two calibrations can be going in different directions in certain situations. <clears throat> uh, there's an example that I'm not showing you today, but uh, there's one case for the Gulf of Mexico, for Gulf Red Snapper, where the intercept survey calibration actually had a consistent effect of increasing estimates for the earlier years that sort of added to the effect of the calibration for the switch from the phone survey to the mail survey. The last two graphs, really, I don't need to go through very, very much detail because they basically show the same pattern 
that I showed on the previous two for Atlantic Cod. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Kelly. Great. All right, thanks, Dave. Um, so as you can all imagine, uh, we can't do a stock assessment for every single species all at once. So we've worked through the transition team to prioritize uh, the list of stocks to get this calibrated data incorporated. Um, and I'm gonna touch on that in more detail in the next slide. Um, the key point on this slide is to kind of highlight the three main decisions that will come out of those stock assessments that are incorporating this revised data. Um, so the first will be stock status. Is there overfishing or do we have an overfish status? Um, are there any needs to, um, or is there a need to make any changes to annual catch limits, whether that's up or down? Um, and then this data is also available uh, to the councils and the commission to inform any discussions that they wanna have about allocations. Next slide. So this is just giving you a snapshot of the upcoming stock assessments. The full list is in Appendix 2 of our revised transition plan, which is available on our website, countmyfish.noaa.gov. Um, and the key ones uh, that you guys are certainly f aware of is striped bass um, and fluke that are coming up this fall. Uh, and then we also have uh, red snapper, um, cod, black sea bass, several others that will happen um, as we move through the next uh, six to nine months. Next slide. So just a few key takeaways to hit on um, overarching messages. There's a substantial increase in effort, especially in the shore mode. Um, and so those stocks that have a higher proportion um, f of catch from shore are more heavily impacted. Um, and we've seen that uh, in the graphs that Dave just walked us through. The changes in effort are generally larger in more recent years, and this is largely being driven by that wireless effect that we talked about. And just to reemphasize these last two points, that the 2018 catch will be back calibrated to that same currency as what was used to set the ACLs to make sure that we're comparing that catch to ACL in the same currency. And finally, um, until this new data is incorporated into stock assessments, um, that's what we'll use, the results of those new stock assessments to determine stock status and any changes to those ACLs. Next slide. So the revised data is now available uh, on the website for folks to look at um, and for use in the planned stock assessments. Um, a reminder that that catch to ACL comparison. Um, we expect that there could be preliminary management changes based for those stocks that have been reassessed as early as 2019. Uh, and additional stocks will be assessed in 2019 to incorporate this calibrated data. Uh, and then that sequence will flow on through 2020 and beyond as we uh, are able to accomplish more of the stock assessments and get the data incorporated. Next slide. These last two slides are just hitting on uh, the upcoming presentations that we'll be doing. We'll be at the Mid-Atlantic Council here next week uh, up at State of New York in September. Um, and then the next slide um, hits on the HMS Advisory Panel as well as the South Atlantic Council um, and the New England Council. Um, and then, oh, we've even expanded to a third slide. Next slide, please. Um, I was like, where's the Gulf? Uh, and then we head down to the Gulf in October. Um, and so we're still figuring out the exact dates, but we'll be talking with the SSC, the commission, um, as well as the full Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council. And with that, Dave and I would be happy to take uh, any questions that y'all might have. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly and Dave. And just to note, um, one other assessment that I know folks are interested in but wasn't up there is the COBIA assessment. And we'll talk about it at the South Atlantic Board, but they're going to delay that assessment by, I think, roughly three months in order to incorporate the new MREP information into it. Um, so I see Tom with his hand up and then Doug. Dave, could you go back to the, I think the first uh, slide or the second slide that you presented about number of trips? Well, you know, as I was looking at the trips and we showed this, a different spike in, in the downward turn and I'm trying to figure out how that would happen. Because I'm just, okay, this is, yeah. According to the, uh, the, the orange graph, the turn takes what we thought was going on from 2007 to 2010. 
Uh, the 2014, those are the numbers you gave me that we were down 6 million trips, 2 million trips in New Jersey and everything else. When I look here, it sees this giant increase in 2000 and on the new estimates on 2000, I think that's either 11 or 12, which is when the recession and the gas prices were all the way high and just the opposite was happening. So I'm trying to collate that because in my mind, because it doesn't seem to make any sense to me, especially to, like, I'm trying to figure out what year that is. Is that 2012 or 2011? You know, Tom, we can certainly look at uh, those sorts of details in, you know, if you have specific questions about the calibrated estimates for a particular year. But I just want to point out that the way the calibration worked for the switch from the phone survey to the mail survey, the, the model actually generated predictions for what you would have gotten with a mail survey for the prior years where we had observations from the telephone survey. The model also generated predictions for the telephone survey for prior years as well, which were pretty close to what the actual observations were. But the way the model worked, it was using both data sources from the side-by-side -side comparisons in the three years to predict both phone and mail estimates that you would have gotten in previous years using the primarily the phone data that we had for the previous years. So there was also a, the target that was used for the model um, wanted to be sure that we had a time series that was consistently uh, connected with what we're getting from the mail survey during the most recent three years and moving forward as we use the mail survey as the sole survey for estimating private boat and shore effort. So what I'm getting to is that there was a smoothing that was done in the predictions to make the the relationship between the estimates for the prior years and the estimates moving forward well connected so there wouldn't be any disruption in the time series. So you won't find that the, the calibrated estimates, that blue curve, that those points will exactly match the same pattern that we had in the uncalibrated estimates in the orange curve. There could be some deviations somewhat from that. So if you're looking for that exact same pattern, just elevated, you won't see that for, uh, for that reason. All I'm saying, Dave, is that that elevation in 2012 shouldn't be there because we knew that's when the recession really hit in full blast. And I think if that 2000, Sandy was there also in that period of time. So I'm trying to figure out why that shows that spike up. Yeah, I appreciate the question, Tom. And we will follow up and I'll, I'll get back to you with with you know, once we take a closer look at that, but I'm pretty sure that the explanation is that, you know, as we're going, as we're doing this calibration, this was an extremely ambitious undertaking. Uh, we look for examples of other government surveys that might have done something like this for their customers. Nobody. <laughs> they basically make a change in how they're doing their surveys and they say, caution. The estimates we're now producing are not necessarily comparable to what we produced in the past with a different methodology. Uh, so this is a very difficult thing to do to try to calibrate and go back through time all the way to 1981 and predict what we would have gotten with a mail survey versus a phone survey. Uh, so the, the model that was used was peer-reviewed and accepted as the best possible approach we could use for this, but it's it's... It, there are going to be some imperfections in it uh, that, that we can't really avoid. Uh, but it's, it's really, I think, given us our best shot at how to do this and, and give, give the stock assessment folks uh, a good consistent time series for use that shows the overall trends in the fishery. And Tom, I know it's really hard to see on these graphs. That spike is, cl is more like 2010. I have Doug, then Lauren, Emerson, Chris, and Justin. Did the switch over to the FES, both in the effort estimates and catch estimates, improve the precision of the estimates? Did it improve, did this change improve the 
precision of the effort and the catch estimates? Yeah, so the precision of the effort estimates, we've looked at that and the, the precision of the effort estimates has not really changed very much between the uncalibrated and the calibrated estimates. Um, there was, um, the calibration model that was used actually included uh, an accounting of um, the influence of the calibration could have on the estimates. So, so that would have a tendency to increase or, or decrease the precision of the calibrated estimates, okay? But then, as I explained, we did smoothing, which basically used a five-year moving average for the predictions for the mail survey estimates. And that had the counteracting effect that ended up not changing the precision on the ep calibrated effort estimates very much from what they were for the uncalibrated estimates. Now for the intercept survey, there is definitely an increase in the, um, or decrease I should say, in the precision of the catch rate estimates as a result of applying the intercept survey calibration. This was not surprising to us because when we implemented the new weighted estimation method, and applied it for 2004 to 2012 to the old MRFS intercept survey data, that weighting the data more appropriately to take into account the complex multi-stage uh, cluster sampling design brought up the variance estimates. And this was what we predicted would happen because uh, we treated the data originally like it was just collected through simple random sampling. And that will give you a much lower variance estimate, but it's not the true variance. <laughs> so the result is basically we now have more realistic estimates of the variance. And so the precision is more accurate for these weighted data because essentially the intercept survey calibration applied weights to the data all the way back to 1981 to more appropriately weight the data to reflect the, the complex sampling design. <clears throat> so the actual precision levels were about the same or higher, but it's more a more accurate reflection of the precision. Does well, yeah, but I mean, the, but you will see, if people are look, comparing the old the old PSEs, okay, the percent standard errors for the catch estimates, for uncalibrated catch estimates, and comparing those to the PSEs for the calibrated catch estimates, you will see that the PSEs are higher now. Lauren. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Kelly, you mentioned early on in your presentation uh, that there was a three times increase in the response rate uh, when we went to the uh, mail protocols, which is certainly laudable and significant. Uh, what I didn't hear you mention was uh, a comparison between that new response rate and the non-response rate. Could you provide us a sense for that, please? Um, with the uh, mail survey, we're currently getting response rates about 35 to 40 percent. So I think what you're asking is uh, what is the non-response rate, and it's obviously just, um, you know, subtract from 100 and you get what that is. So it's basically a 60 to 65 percent non-response rate. Um, what, I, what I would say is that uh, in, in surveys in general, I was just at the joint statistics meetings last week in Vancouver, Canada, and uh, overall conventional surveys that are based on probability sampling are continuing to see gradually declining response rates. So what the focus is now for, for doing surveys is to try to make sure you can get as high a response rate as possible and so going from a response rate that was less than 10% in the most recent years for the 
Coastal Household Telephone Survey to response rate of 35 to 40 is a substantial improvement, which you recognized. But we also worry about the non-response. We want to be sure that there's not a non-response bias. So it's important to do follow-up non-response surveys, where basically you follow up and survey people that did not respond initially with different approaches, different incentives, to get them to respond and see if they're different on average than the people who did respond to the mail survey initially. We have done studies like that with the new mail survey and we're not able to show that there was a non-response bias. But we will be continuing to look at that uh, moving forward and we'll continue to monitor the non-response rates from year to year and be doing follow-up surveys to check to be sure we don't have a non-response bias. Emerson. Thank you, Tony. and. Uh, um, thank you, uh, Kelly and Dave, for your presentation. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is relative to assessments, and I don't know, maybe Katie, you can help out on this, or, or maybe somebody else can. But um, in terms of assessments, I'm wondering how these new numbers might affect um, the output of the assessments and how that's going to work. So the first part of that question is, you know, for the new assessments coming up, um, are, is the blue line or the yellow line going to inform the assessment? That's part A of that. And, and, and part B is if it's, if it's the blue line, right, then effort is much greater than what it, we thought it was in the past on the recreational side. F is much greater than we thought it was in the past. Therefore, um, um, the biomass levels have to be greater to account for that. So how is this all going to work out and what's it going to do to the retrospective patterns in, in the assessments? I know that's a very broad question, but I'm trying to get some, some handle on that. That's, that's the first question. And the second one is a little bit easier. Uh, yeah, th I mean, I think that is that is the question. And I will say, first of all, we won't know for sure until we actually do the assessment. But we will be using the blue line in all of our assessments going forward. So that is the best available data. That's what's going to go into our assessments. Um, in general, I think your sort of intuition is correct, that catch is really what scales our sense of biomass. So this doesn't change anything about our fishery independent indices going into this. So we're looking at the sort of the same trends in relative abundance, but now you're taking out more fish. So if the population went up a certain amount with taking out, you know, the pre-uncalibrated catch, now, you know, that trend hasn't changed, but we're just taking out a lot more fish. So probably F won't change that much, but it'll just say there's more fish out there that we have been taking out, and the population trends will remain similar. Um, there will be changes to the length structure and the age structure because of the differences in how much you're taking from shore and how much you're taking from the ocean, but um, that'll be a, on a species-by-species species basis. Um, but I think overall, probably our most expected result would be that, in general, the models are going to say there's more fish out there, but we're still taking sort of the same percentage of them that we were before. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and my, my second question is, um, for these various um, um, graphs that you generated, is it possible to show the 95 percent confidence interval? for all of those data points and if you could, is a, you know, I'm just wondering where the 95% confidence interval is between the, the blue and the, and the yellow lines there. How close or far away are they? It's certainly possible to do that. We have done that. I've generated versions of these graphs that actually have 95% confidence limits on the new calibrated estimates. Uh, and generally those don't overlap with the uncalibrated estimate curve, uh, as you might expect, because these differences are quite large. Um, but yeah, we, we can certainly do that, but for the purposes of this presentation, we thought those graphs were a little noisy with all the 95% confidence intervals for every year on the graph. <laughs> All right, Chris. Thank you. Um, 
Tom uh, actually asked a similar question to what I was going to ask about just the timing of, uh, of the, the trends versus you know, the recession. Uh, I guess on a similar note, um, the, uh, at least looking for the trends in North Carolina for the shore fishery, uh, the shore estimates uh, in the new, new calibration showed a, uh, a steady increase uh, since, since the 80s and even more so uh, recently. While the old estimates uh, showed a, an even to slight decrease in, in recent years, however, in the last geez, probably 10 years, maybe more, uh, shore access for uh, for fishermen has decreased in our state as well as, as other states. I, I uh, suspect. So I'll need to uh, touch base with our uh, our Emirat folks to get a sense of where people are fishing. But I was wondering, has, you know, during this, this development, <clears throat> was the uh, the issue of just less shore access for anglers in recent years, um, I guess, discussed when compared to the increase in, uh, in shore fishing effort from the, the new uh, estimates. Thanks. Well, we didn't, it, it, what we rely on, I guess, in, in doing these surveys is that uh, what people are telling us is an accurate reflection of what they're actually doing in terms of their fishing activity. So from the phone survey that, that we've replaced with the new mail survey for many years, we, we basically just accepted what people told us about how often they're going fishing. So if something was causing people to take fewer shore fishing trips, then the expectation was that when uh, households are responding to the survey, they would actually report fewer trips. Uh, and fewer households would actually report having taken any trips. Uh, so that's what the expectation is, that the survey itself will tell you what changes in effort are occurring. Uh, with the new mail survey, we think we're getting more accurate estimates now uh, for reasons that Kelly went over during the presentation. Um, so we're basically taking what the respondents in the households we're contacting by mail are telling us about their fishing trips, how often they're fishing from shore, how often they're fishing from private boats uh, during a two-month period that we're asking them about. And we're using that as the indicator of the total amount of trips. So if something is causing people to take fewer trips, then we should see that in the data that's reported. Follow up, Chris. Uh, yeah, thanks. So uh, that was, I guess, over the three-year period where you did the side-by-side -side comparison, um, but then it get, you calculated it back to, to earlier years. <clears throat> We're just, you know, using North Carolina as an example. Uh, there was quite a few more ocean fishing piers available back in the 80s and 90s uh, compared to today. So, I mean, I, I'm just wondering how if there's a limitation just on you know, looking at this three-year period uh, of most recent years, which will help going forward as far as back calculating you know, to see what, what the differences are back then, because obviously the differences in number of trips are greater now than what the, it was predicted in earlier times. I think, I think the best way to answer your question, to make sure I've got it right, is that you're saying that it's, it's a difficult thing to do to predict what we would have gotten from a mail survey back in the 1980s based on the comparisons we're doing for 2015, 16, and 17. That, that's a perfectly good point to make. <laughs> we understood this as we set out to do this calibration, that this was going to be a very difficult task to predict exactly what what we would have gotten from a mail survey back that far back in time. And I think uh, we all understood that the uncertainty of the calibration increases the further you go back in time. Um, but we had to work with what was available, what we actually had in hand. We had the ability to do the two surveys, which was costly, you know, cost us twice as much to do both surveys in three years side by side in all states so that we would have the ability to see what consistent differences were there in terms of how households respond to telephone versus mail. And we were also able to look at this potential wireless effect by using additional information outside of the surveys that was 
basically information we got on how wireless phone use has increased over time uh, relative to landline use and other factors were examined in the model itself to see if they were significant covariates. But um, yeah, it's, it's difficult to do. We gave it our best shot and uh, the model that was used to do it, uh, we did, we did you know, subject it to a peer review. We had six independent reviewers that reviewed it and all recommended it, to use this method moving forward, uh, recognizing that it was really a well-designed approach uh, for accomplishing this, but there will be some uncertainty, no doubt. Yeah. Okay, we have Justin and then Roy. No, actually, I'm all set. Previous questioners kind of covered the ground I was going to cover. So thanks. Thank you, Roy. Uh, thank you, Kelly and Dave. I'm like Emerson. I'm uh, most interested in the management implications of these results. And um, I don't recall you putting up a graph of summer flounder. I don't think you did. Did you not? But, but let's assume you had a graph of summer flounder. We do have one. Stand by. <laughs> we do. All right. We, we, we were going to give summer flounder to the Mid-Atlantic to see, but Jess, it's in the end, in the behind the scenes slides. Well, let's assume for the moment while you're searching for it, it shows similar trends to some of the other species. Um, well, it, maybe it doesn't. What I was wondering is, in terms of management implications, what if the ratio of commercial to recreational harvest changes appreciably as a result of this recalibration? It, it could potentially change our um, allocation paradigm that we've been using with species like summer flounder. But I'm not sure that your, your results would back that up, other than obviously it shows higher harvest. It looks like a fairly consistently higher harvest. I don't know if you've, you've thought about that yet, or is that a future job when we're going to consider the management implications of, of these results? I think, Roy, for all of these, all of our species, as we can th think about ch making changes, that uh, we'll want to see how they impact the assessments, and then from the assessments, think about management implications. Um, you asked about summer flounder because summer flounder is a species that we manage jointly with the Mid-Atlantic Council. These will be things that we take up with the council together um, to think about those changes. Um, you know, there may be a shift in the percentages between the commercial and recreational fishery, but it'll be up to the, the board and the council to determine whether or not they think that that shift is, um, there, there should be a change. if or not, um, the, the board and council could decide that they're not going to use the years of history that we previously used to set the allocation. You could just set the allocation based on a percentage, based on a different rationale. It'll be up to the two bodies to discuss those issues and then move forward with management. I think, though, the idea is to not make any definitive changes in management until we see the results of the assessment from the discussions that I've um, heard. Summer founder is one of the species that we'll have um, very quickly. Uh, it's going through peer review in December. Uh, so will the board and council will see the results of that assessment um, in February. I just wanted to add, Roy, that um it may not be real apparent on this slide, but the proportional change is actually greater in the more recent years, similar to what we saw on other slides for other species. If we actually show the very next slide, you can see for total catch, it's a, it's a little bit more apparent that you're seeing that similar pattern. I think we have time for one more question, if we do, um, and if, all right, Ray. Yeah, just a question, Kelly. I presume these surveys are self-addressed postage paid stamps. So the recreational angler doesn't have to spend the dime on postage and 
Right. Thank you. And the answer was yes, since Kelly didn't turn on her mic. Sorry, Sorry. Kelly. That's well, all right. I can see my head. <laughs> Just for the recording, <laughs> um, for those in the um, on the webinar. Uh, so, without any additional questions, and if you have uh, other questions, um, you can always email Kelly and Dave. I'm also on the transition team that Kelly and Dave co-chair, so I'm happy to um, relay any questions to them, or if you have any concerns or thoughts or um, information that the public is sharing with you that you think is important for the transition team to know about, please um, let me know. And Kelly and Dave, thank you so much for coming and giving us some of your time for this really important information. Sure. Thank you. And thanks to you and Katie for answering all the hard questions that I usually have to answer. <laughs> we will start the Atlantic Menhaden board at 3.30 in 15 minutes.